It's tax time here in the U.S., and yesterday I decided it was appropriate to post one of my old videos from 2015, which demonstrated that metal sales in the U.S. are not actually taxed at 28%, as most people in the community believe. Today I was going to make a video about whether or not a person should pay taxes on metal price appreciation. As part of the groundwork for that video, I did a little exercise that can stand on its own. I'll cover this exercise first, and then discuss the morality of taxation and whether or not a person should submit to it in another video. Maybe I'll release that video after I've calculated my taxes for 2020 so that I'm good and angry. So now, on to the exercise. We are all well aware <clears throat> that governments tax our income, and the more we earn, the more they tax. In the U.S., we pay federal income tax, state income tax, and an employment tax to cover Social Security and Medicare. The money we're lucky enough not to forfeit to taxes can be used to pay for living expenses, such as a house and its associated property tax, such as food and clothing and its associated sales tax, such as a car and its associated registration fees and fuel taxes, and such as cell phones and their associated use taxes. You get the picture. Those of us who are fortunate to have something left over after all of that may choose to save and invest it. There are many things a person can use for this purpose. Everyone on this channel has chosen to save at least a portion of that surplus wealth in precious metal bars, rounds, and coins. Some of us here own some stocks and stock mutual funds. Some probably own some fixed income investments, such as CDs and bonds. All of these assets, if chosen well, should increase in price over time. But the increase in price is somewhat illusory, because over time, the value of the currency will decrease because it's constantly being created by governments to pay for deficit spending. Our own currency in the U.S. has decreased in value by 85% since the year 1970, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, which many believe understates the magnitude of currency debasement. A person who purchased an ounce of silver in 1970 and sold it today would find that the number of U.S. Federal Reserve notes received is about 16 times what was paid to buy the coin decades ago. But, this 16 time increase in cash does not translate to 16 times the purchasing power. No. If we simply adjust for the change in value of the U.S. Federal Reserve note, we'd find that the silver owner only increased their purchasing power by a factor of 2.4. But the government does not tax the 2.4 fold gain. The government wants to tax the total nominal 16 fold price appreciation. So what's this table all about? Well, I set this up to show everyone what the impact of taxation is on the illusory component of price appreciation created by the debauchment of the currency. It will apply to any savings vehicle that at least keeps up with price inflation, not just precious metals. One can start by looking at the left-hand column. It represents the level of currency debasement over any arbitrary period of time. So let's take our 50-year holding period as an example. If one uses the CPI to determine that the currency has lost 85% of its value, then one would trace this column down to the second to last row that says 85%. The column immediately to the right is how much price appreciation is needed to merely maintain purchasing power. So our example, silver holder, would have needed his silver to appreciate in price by 567% just to maintain his purchasing power over the last 50 years. The silver holder's entire nominal price gain will be subject to tax. But of that nominal price gain, 567% of it is just a tax on inflation protection. It's not right. It's not just. And this is probably the most powerful argument for not paying the tax. But let's continue with this example as if the silver owner was going to pay the tax. How much of his real wealth does he forfeit to this tax on inflation? This table will show you. Trace the second to last line over to the appropriate marginal tax bracket. If he's in the 12% tax bracket, then an additional 10% of his wealth would be forfeit to the tax on currency debauchment. If he had lots of income in the year of the sale, then the percentage increases. Since silver is a collectible, the maximum tax on it is 28%. And so we see here that he or she would forfeit about 25% of his or her real wealth to the tax on inflation. It's horrible stuff, really. 
especially when one considers that the person already paid taxes on the income used to purchase the coin in the first place. A person who is taxed at the 24% rate uh, of his or her earnings years and then is subject to a tax of 25% on his or her wealth later uh, as an inflation tax is actually only keeping 57% of the fruits of his or her labor. It gets even worse when you consider the impact of state income tax. So there you have it. You can pause the video if you like and play a few mental experiments with this table. The double taxation on inflation is not, uh, is not too horrible a thing over short periods of time. But as you can see, over longer periods of time, the inflation tax is really, really unjust. Now I'll talk about remedies for this in another video. Happy tax time, folks.